In New Testament terms, to have an exodus is to get out of the world. However, without the picture in the book of Exodus, it's difficult to say just how we are to get out of the world. Even to talk about it without consulting the picture may lead us into confusion. How we thank the Lord for the picture and the ministry we have today to unveil this picture to us. Please stay with us for this life study of the Bible with Witness Lee, a program furnished by Living Stream Ministry and featuring the ministry of Watchman Nee and Witness Lee. Witness Lee served Christ for more than 70 years before going to be with the Lord in 1997. His life's work included a thorough life study of the entire Bible. And today's program again brings us to the Old Testament book of Exodus. And Ron Kangas is here as we look at the exodus of Israel out of the tyranny and enslavement of Egypt. Welcome back to the program, Ron. I'm glad to be here, in particular for this message. We're talking about an exodus from the world depicted for us graphically in the book of Exodus. The way this picture is presented in this message is very illuminating and very compelling. We need to realize that experientially, Many, many believers today have experienced Christ as their Passover. God has passed over them. The blood of the Lamb has redeemed them from the righteous judgment of God. But they remain in Egypt, still needing to make an exodus so that God's purpose to have a dwelling place can be fulfilled. If we care only for the benefits that come to us through salvation, we may be content to remain in Egypt with Christ as our Passover lamb. But if we care for God's economy, not only will we make our exodus from Egypt, we will be burdened that all of God's people be released from Egypt and to serve God and to be one with him for the building up of the church as his body to consummate the new Jerusalem. It's with this latter matter in view that we're burdened to enter into the fellowship and the ministry of today's message from the book of Exodus. Well, you alluded to a couple of the items that are present in this portion. We do have the Passover that is such a graphic depiction of our redemption in Christ and more. And then another matter, and that is the actual Exodus, the getting out. Let's join Witness Lee with our first portion today. Following Passover was Exodus. It means today in the New Testament time to get out of the world. But it is not so simple. Without such a picture, how to get out of the world? I can pick up all the verses from the New Testament concerning the world. And I can expand, I can tell you all the points of all the verses concerning the world from which we have to get out. But still, you don't get a picture. Now, here is a picture. The exodus from Egypt for the children of Israel was not accomplished by themselves. It was accomplished by the saving God. First of all, God comes in to subdue Satan, to subdue all the things, all the people who take side with Satan, even the subdued environment. By that time, in that night, the environment, the situation, was fully subdued by God. They had to get out because through those 12 negotiations with 10 plagues. God subdued Pharaoh, Egyptians, and the whole Egypt situation. The entire environment was made by God just for them to get out. For God's chosen people to have the Passover, that's not too hard. But for God to them people to have the exodus, to get out of Egypt, to get out of the world, this is not so easy. To have the exodus is not only up to you, it is even the more up to the environment. Suppose Pharaoh would not agree with 
suppose the whole entire situation and environment in Egypt would not give any permission to the children of Israel, how could they have an exodus? It's impossible. Today, tens of thousands of the saved Christians, they have only taken parcel. Out of 100 Christians today, it's hard to say one or two have had a full exodus, including you, because in your environment, still some persons, some of the things have not been subdued. You all could see to take the Passover was just overnight matter. To have the exodus, it was a long struggle. We all know the story. It was by 12 negotiations with 10 plagues. Don't think it is so easy for God to save his chosen people out of the usurping hand of Satan and the world. It is so easy. It is not so easy. Many had the Passover, but they still don't have the Exodus. Ron, following the Lord's severe dealings with Pharaoh with the ten plagues, Israel had two major things in front of them, both pictures of our own experience. First, of course, was the Passover. But then they also needed their exodus. They needed to get out of Egypt. Why was this much more difficult for them to enter into than the Passover? Consider what's portrayed here. As far as I can recall, there was no opposition from the Egyptians to the mere observance of the Passover. Perhaps the Egyptians thought the Israelites were strange in uh, killing a lamb and sprinkling the blood on the door as they did on the door lintel and doorpost. Then they went inside and they ate the flesh of the lamb. There seems to be no opposition to this. But with the matter of leaving Egypt, there was tremendous opposition that came through the environment. The reason an exodus is much more difficult than simply experiencing the Passover lamb is that an exodus requires the subduing of the environment. And this word subdue is a critical word. Egypt the total environment of Egypt, especially Pharaoh with his stubbornness and hard-heartedness, all this needed to be subdued. This takes a lot of power, and it takes a lot of transactions. So before the exodus could take place, there needed to be the subduing of Pharaoh and the subduing of the environment. Uh, now, relating this to our experience, we realize that if we experientially would be released from the kingdom of Satan, from Satan's tyranny through the world system, there needs to be a very significant subduing of those things and sometimes those persons in our environment who are determined and who are used by the enemy to keep us in bondage and in slavery in the world. So the situation was difficult, but God is resourceful, and God had a way to subdue the whole situation and to accomplish this difficult, actually humanly impossible task of carrying out a marvelous exodus of Israel out of Egypt. Well, Ron, as we got into the details of the Passover, I think the richness and the fullness of this whole thing became uh, much more vivid and clear. We're going to see in this coming section there are some details attached to the Exodus that also bring out much clarity and much richness. Let's go back to Witness Lee. For us to be rescued from the usurping hand of Satan and from the occupation of the world, we need God's hind to come in to subdue. The blood saved 
the children of Israel from God's righteous judgment. But the hand saved them from the usurping hand of Pharaoh. Pharaoh and the Egyptians were subdued to such an extent that they drove them out. They just couldn't tolerate their staying there in their country for one minute. They begged Moses and Aaron and all the children of Israel, go, please go. We ask you to do us a favor. Don't remain here any longer. Right away, get out. Today, if I would go back to the word, the whole world said, when I say pray, don't come back. <laughs> don't come back. If you come back, you will give us a lot of trouble. Praise, go, go away. The farther the better. The Lord commanded them, the children of Israel, not to have any leavened bread. That night, when they were being driven out of Egypt, if you still have the time to prepare some leavened bread, it would be hard for you to get out of Egypt. If you still have the time to handle the sinful things, it's hard for you to get out of the world. Sometimes God even would use sickness, weakness. You still would remain in the lab, in some sinful things. Sickness and weakness would not allow you to remain in any kind of a leavened situation. The children of Israel, they had to go. There was no time for them to labor anything, but there was time for them to plunder, to get something. In God's salvation, to get you out of the world, He would not give you, or the environment would not give you any time to labor your situation, but rather... God would raise up a kind of situation that you would plunder the world of its wealth. Have you ever noticed in the Bible, God at least once commanded the robbing, to rob the people, rob the Egyptians, plunder the Egyptians of their wealth. Gold, silver were needed for the building up of the tabernacle, and the gold raiment were needed but also the building of the tabernacle. The linens, all this wealth was gold for the building of the tabernacle. For the building of God's testimony, there was such a need. Have you ever thought about it? That for us, the chosen people of God, to get out of the world, there is an aspect. We have to get out of it. By plundering it. Don't come out of the world with nothing. Your hands, your pocket, all have to be filled. Ron, the details of these pictures are really marvelous, especially as we see our own experience developed in them. The Passover, as we saw yesterday, prohibited the eating of leavened bread. And now, in their exodus out of Egypt, the children of Israel were required to plunder the wealth of Egypt. This is very interesting. Why would the righteous God command his people, in a sense, to rob or even steal from Egypt? I'm glad you added the disclaimer, in a sense. In a sense, to rob or to steal. The word plunder somehow may imply a kind of lawless taking of possessions that are not rightfully yours. But God is righteous. Later, this righteous God commanded his people not to steal. So surely, the plundering here was not actually a robbing or a stealing. Rather, and instead of being an unrighteous act of taking things, it was a righteous repayment for centuries of enforced slave labor. So there are a few things here, and I have some real feeling, even some burden concerning this. First, God is righteous in all of his ways. In everything he did to subdue Pharaoh and to release Egypt, God was righteous. 
The children of Israel were slaves for more than 400 years. That in itself is an unrighteous situation. As a result of their slave labor, Egypt acquired many riches. So there was a direct connection between their laboring and the riches of Egypt. They did not receive a just payment for their labors while they were in Egypt. So, at the time of the Exodus, God charged Moses to tell the children of Israel to request so many different kinds of riches from the Egyptians. They requested them, and the people found favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, and the Egyptians gave them many riches. Actually, this was a delayed payment for all of their labor. So Egypt was plundered in the sense that vast wealth was taken out of Egypt. But Egypt was not plundered in the sense that the wealth was stolen or robbed or taken improperly. Now another matter here is to see why it was necessary in God's economy to plunder Egypt in this way. Christians can go to unbiblical extremes. One is that they may be worldly, even as the Egyptians are worldly, and desire to have wealth in the world. Another extreme is a religious extreme which says, uh, we don't need any wealth, we don't need any material supply, we just need to be saved and delivered. Actually, the building up of the tabernacle required materials, in particular, a lot of gold. Where would this come from? It came from Egypt, but it was not for Egypt. It came through the labor of the children of Israel, but it was not for the children of Israel. It was for God. So here we see a tremendous matter that we need to labor in the world, received righteous and proper payment for our labor, and then use the result of our labor, not for ourselves, not for our indulgence or enjoyment, but for God's dwelling place. This is a marvelous picture how God, who is righteous and holy, secured a late and delayed payment for centuries of labor brought these riches accrued through this payment out of Egypt for the building up of his dwelling place. What a vivid and enlightening picture this is. Well, Ron, you surely did have some feeling and burden on this point. I think this coming one, even though it's going to be very short, may elicit some more feeling and burden. At least that's our hope. To set it up, I think we need a couple of verses from chapter 12 and one from chapter 13. In chapter 12, verse 41 and at the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the armies of Jehovah went from the land of Egypt. And then chapter 13, verse 18. Thus God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up arrayed for battle out of the land of Egypt. Let's join again, Witness Lee. In the night of the day of Passover, all the children of Israel didn't sleep. They had the rest. They had the satisfaction. Even they had joy. But they didn't have the sleep. In verse 42, concerning the night of observation, it implies that God was observing. Actually, the Hebrew word here really means watching. That was a night of watching. Not only a night of watching, by God, but also in that watching by God's people. God is watching, God is observing to rescue you out of the world, and you have to do the same thing to cooperate with God, to watch, to observe the whole situation. You have to get out. You don't know in the whole night, at least a few hours, what would be the right time for you to march up. The children of Israel, all became the armies of God. The original meaning in verse 18 of chapter 13. They went out in martial array. And actually the Hebrew word means 
They marched out in ranks of five. They didn't go out in a very loose way, sloppy way. They went out five a row, five a row, five a row, five a rank. They marched out. They marched out as what? As an army. They were surely in a martial array. To get out of the world, need you to be a soldier in the martial array. Why? This is not just a kind of a human thing. This is a satanic fighting. We are fighting with the world. We need to be the army. It is not only armed with some weapons, but you are in a martial array. You are fighting. You are ready to fight with others. You have all these points in the New Testament, but you could never be impressed with them. Here, you have a clear picture to impress you. God's chosen people getting out of the world need to be an army, not just by yourself, but with others. And with others, not in a sloppy way, but in a martial way. We Christians in the church must be martial. And what do we do? We do it in a martial way. No one can be martial unless he is in the army. So we must realize to get out of the world is not an easy thing. Right after 400 long and suffering years, the children of Israel left Egypt according to the word of Jehovah. But rather than leaving with skipping and rejoicing, as we might imagine, they marched out, arrayed as an army in battle. What does this very poignant picture depict for us, Ron? I'm glad, Chris, that you use the words uh, skipping and rejoicing, because this makes the point, I feel, that in a time of emancipation like this, it's altogether possible for someone to be overcome and besides themselves with a kind of ecstasy and exhilaration over the sheer fact of being released from bondage. And when that happens, God's people may behave in a rather unseemly or undignified way. And that kind of behavior may damage God's testimony in the spiritual realm. Instead of leaping and skipping out of Egypt, the children of Israel marched out, arrayed as an army in battle. They marched out in dignity. What a display this was to the observing angels, good and evil. What a shame this was to the principalities and powers. And what an indication this was that actually what we have here is a spiritual warfare. Furthermore, the way they left Egypt, arrayed as an army in battle, indicates that they were to be formed into an army to fight for God's interests. They were to be not only the people of God, they were to be the armies of God fighting for God's interests subduing and driving out the occupants of the good land and gaining that land for God's kingdom and dwelling place. So we have this poignant, this striking, this powerful picture of an army marching out of the world system dominated by Satan. And this is an indicator, furthermore, that in spiritual warfare, God's people need to become, in Christ, imposing, even frightening to the enemy. It reminds me of that verse in Song of Songs, it may be in chapter 6, that the seeker of Christ becomes terrible as an army with banners, frightening to the enemy. So this was an awesome sight. It was a glorious sight. It was a God-honoring occasion in which the redeemed of the Lord were not overcome by their own exhilaration at being released. Rather, they were themselves uh, sober, in order, in rank, and they were headed out and they marched out of Egypt as a glorious testimony of the triumph of the triune God. 
Hallelujah for this. Hallelujah for this. Another incredibly striking and very vivid picture. Ron, are you aware of another book in the Bible that has such incredible pictures for us as Exodus? I'm not aware of one, and I really don't think there is one. Exodus is a remarkable picture book. When we put the pictures in Exodus together with the captions in the New Testament, the captions being the clear verbal propositional revelation, we have a marvelous unveiling of God's complete salvation. Well, Ron, uh, my thanks, but I think our collective thanks to the Lord for both this time together and the marvelous, incredible ministry that we have the opportunity and really the honor to bring to the listeners each day. Appreciate your being with us. Thank you. I look forward to coming again for more fellowship and co-labor in the very near future. We'll have you back very soon. We hope you'll be back as soon as tomorrow as we once again pick up the book of Exodus through the eyes of the life study of the Bible by Witness Lee. And these life studies, as we mention each day, are printed and edited, bound in volumes. And each of these volumes, about 200 to 250 pages, uh, is our radio offer to our listeners for just $5. And this is volume number two. We had 22 messages in volume one. We're now in volume two. If you're interested in this radio offer or just to contact us and leave us with your comments or ask questions, our toll-free number is 1-888-LIFE-STUDY. That's 543-3788. And our mailing address is Living Stream Ministry, Post Office Box 2121, Anaheim, California, 92814. And our email address is radio at lsm.org. Our time has expired. We do invite you back tomorrow. Please join us then. Today for Ron Kangas, I'm Chris Wilde. Thank you very much for listening.